Like it's time, good morning to those of you here on the West Coast, and good afternoon to the rest of the sector joining us today. My name is David Bradley, and on behalf of AS Manufacturing Engineering Director Lance Bryant, I'd like, you to, like to welcome you to our second webinar that Manufacturing Engineering is holding in conjunction with the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. Just a couple of items before we get done, before we begin. If you have questions for our presenter today, be sure to click on the speech bubble that I understand is just above my head online. We'll record your questions here and they'll be relayed to our presenter afterwards. We'll probably hold the questions until the end. And today's topic, just to remind you, is about 3D printing and its transition into nano manufacturing. And our presenter is none other than the man who runs Aerospace Systems' own rapid manufacturing lab. Boris Fritz is an Engineer 5 and a 27-year team member. He holds three patents. He's a part-time faculty member at Loyola Marymount University and also on the advisory board of Ananda College in Northern California. Mr. Fritz has been very active in the Society of Manufacturing Engineers for over 20 years. In fact, he founded its National Nano Manufacturing Technical Group and currently serves as Vice Chair of the SME Innovation Watch Committee. Mr. Fritz has been on the advisory board of SME's Rapid Conference for the last nine years, speaking and chairing sessions on the state of the industry of nano manufacturing. He's published and presented many papers on additive manufacturing at numerous universities, both in the United States and, across, and, uh, and throughout Europe. And in 1998, he received the Outstanding Engineering Achievement Merit Award from the Engineers Council of California. We are very honored to have him with us today. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Boris Fritz. Thank you. I'm very excited to share all this information with you. The subject, as you see, the silent industrial <clears throat> revolution, 3D printing and its transition into nano manufacturing. And the reason I have the silent in red is because the majority of people in the world have no idea that this revolution is coming that's going to really transform the way we make things and it affects really every uh, sector of manufacturing. So um, my purpose in this talk is to start out with a very specific technology known as 3D printing and more commonly in the field known as additive manufacturing or additive layer manufacturing and then look at its potential not only at Northrop but also its future in our world. Uh, then we'll also examine how 3D printing is unique in its ability to transform the way we manufacture parts, but not just at the normal scale. The interesting thing is that it also goes all the way down to the nano scale. So we really have micro and nano involved in this as well. And people aren't aware of the, this technology in terms of nano. And uh, this is something that you won't find in books. And uh, with the nano manufacturing tech group, I've kind of uh, instigated that. So um, we'll also examine some of the implications of nano manufacturing that go beyond the additive layer process. And then finally, we'll look at technology and how it will transform our world by the end of the century. So um, there's a lot I'm covering. And, but I'm doing that because uh, if you're going to take the time to listen to it, I want to give you the big picture. And this is something I've been involved with. Um, uh, as David said, that I'm on a vice chair of the Innovation Watch Committee for SME. And so um, I really like to be aware of the type of things that are coming into the world that we uh, foresee in the next year, in the next five years, and then uh, also interested in what's coming the rest of the century. So quickly, just an uh, overview of additive manufacturing, then in-house capability, then the future of additive manufacturing, then how it transitions into the nano scale, and then the future of technology. 
So how did all this start for me? Um, some 21 years ago, I uh, was put in charge of the uh, rapid prototyping or additive manufacturing lab here in, at Northrop. And then um, as <clears throat> time went on, um, I became very active in SME in terms of uh, rapid manufacturing. And at that time in 2003, I became chairman of the uh, rapid technologies additive manufacturing community. And that time uh, started the tech groups. And um, my dream was to have SME represented in terms of nanotechnology because nanotechnology is mostly was mostly technology at the time and very little manufacturing, but that's the future. How do we apply it in the real world? So my idea was to start the nano manufacturing tech group at the time to um, implement that and to raise awareness of the type of things that are uh, possible. And also, the, the reason that nano manufacturing tech group is under the RTAM community is because of the additive manufacturing capability that we see in both places. So it's a perfect fit in that sense. And so um, from there now, let's go to kind of to the beginnings and look at rapid prototyping, as it used to be called. Um, it was also called uh, now, of course, additive manufacturing, really meaning additive layer manufacturing. Um, rapid manufacturing, direct digital manufacturing, solid freeform fabrication. Uh, Northrop calls it DPM, direct, uh, direct part manufacturing. And um, you know it probably as 3D printing. And <clears throat> there's a little bit of a misnomer to call the whole field 3D printing because you know how a printer uh, prints things for you in the office and it's not that accurate. You're not concerned about that the letters are within a few thousandth of an inch accuracy. No, you just want a, a, a representative model of what you're printing out, of the pictures, whatever. Uh, and in the same way, when now you, if you have three-dimensional printing, you're not concerned about, uh, it's more for visual display, that sort of thing. So a 3D printer is really uh, a little bit more of a low-tech type of, uh, uh, approach of additive manufacturing, which actually surprisingly is getting fairly accurate as well. But um, so what does um, additive manufacturing really mean? It's an additive process of automated part creation directly from a CAD model, from a computer aided design model. And that's differentiated from uh, NC machining or machining center. Uh, we're used to making everything in a, uh, using a subtractive process. You start out with a, a piece of material, like a, a piece of steel, uh, a hulk of steel or uh, foam or whatever you want to use, and then a cutter cuts this uh, into shape, kind of like a sculptor, down to the uh, what you want, and the rest are chips that you throw away or uh, recycle. Uh, um, now, when you get more and more complicated parts, you don't only want to use XYZ for your automated NC machine or machining center. Um, you start adding, uh, uh, you call it what's called a five axis machine. So you have the cutter moving in X, Y, and Z, but it's also swiveling in the I and J vectors. That's in the X kind of swivel and Y swivel. And then it's all combined into a very, uh, complex uh, motion, which is very complex mathematically. I used to program these back in the early 80s at McDonnell Douglas and um, using a, like a Fortran-like language. And um, so you can imagine the complexity of that kind of uh, programming as opposed to now taking X, Y, Z, I, and J and reducing it to layer by layer in additive manufacturing where you start out only with what you need and, and you reduced everything down to X and Y, just a flat uh, plane, and then you stack the planes together and they, they, uh, they cure over each other so you have one solid part. But um, the, the whole thing is simplified tremendously. Now, 
Uh, what's the other advantage of that? Um, and this is like, still one of my favorite cartoons. Uh, okay, here comes the part where we always screw up, getting the ship inside the bottle. See, with the old methods of subtractive process of manufacturing, um, you have this type of problem. Uh, you can't make complex uh, assemblies as in one unit. Whereas in additive manufacturing, if you imagine uh, I don't know if you can see the cursor there on the screen, but let's say we're halfway through this bottle. Um, what you do in, in additive manufacturing, the, uh, the CAD model already has the ship in the bottle. It's modeled that way. And so what you do is like when you're halfway here, the part of the ship has already been built in here and part of the glass uh, surrounding it. And then it keeps on building layer by layer until at this point the ship is finished and then uh, here comes the, the last part of the bottle and you're done. And then that CAD model is then given to the NC machine to grow it that way. And uh, so here's one example. There's quite a few different machines out there. I won't go into all the uh, different machines because uh, I just want you to understand the concept behind it. Uh, then you kind of understand more or less how they all work. Uh, this is the machine we use uh, here at North, or one of the machines, the selective laser sintering process. We um, selectively, with a laser, sinter or melt the powder layer by layer. And uh, then you have these pistons of uh, powder supply that the roller rolls, the, like this moves up, supplies the powder and rolls it across. Then the laser scans the next layer. And to make this a little more understandable, uh, let's imagine you have uh, this, uh, what we call a brain gear. And this is already uh, designed like this in CAD, fully designed. And what you have to make sure is that all these gears are equidistant from the center uh, portion, because if it touches anywhere, then the laser fuses it together. But as long as you have that gap equidistant, then when this machine, that when this comes out of the uh, added manufacturing machine, all you do is dust it off and with the air gun, and boom, there, the whole thing is fully functional. There's no assembly required. Um, to give you an idea, halfway up on this, uh, once you've grown this portion from uh, we grow it layer by layer. Uh, you can see that there's an equidistant um, like between the spindle and the gear. And so this just continues growing till at the last point uh, the laser fuses the last portion together. Then like an archaeologist, you dig into the powder and you take out the part and clean it. And you look like a Pillsbury Doughboy when you're done you know, with all the white powder. But um, anyway, we use primarily a nylon 12 powder here, which is uh, quite strong. Um, uh, here, watch this short little movie. It'll give you a better idea how it works. A CAD design is transferred to the center station. A roller then deposits a precise amount of powder over the build area. The laser centers or almost melts the powder to form a single layer of the prototype. The build area piston lowers, and the roller deposits another layer of material to be centered. This process continues, and in a matter of hours, the entire part has been built. So here at um, Northrop in El Segundo, we have a couple of machines that I'll go over uh, uh, briefly. Um, the one uh, in the 902 building, um, the one I work on primarily, is the selective laser sintering machine, um, making a nylon 12 uh, uh, using a nylon 12 powder. The part build volume is 12 and a half by 11 by about 16 inches. And um, um, here are some of the uh, material properties, the material data sheet. Uh, this is online. This presentation will be available later. So you can uh, look at these. I won't dwell on it. Um, now, the other machine we have in the 202 building is it's called stereolithography system, the iPro 8000. That one has a build volume of 25 by 29 by 21 inches. And um, this uses a photopolymer uh, liquid resin. It's a light sensitive liquid plastic cured layer by layer uh, by an ultraviolet laser. 
The other machine, um, the selective laser sintering, is a CO2 laser, you know, curing the, the powder layer by layer. So uh, they used, uh, in, on the IPRO 8000, they used the Acura Blue Stone material. It's also a very good material. Um, it's stiffer than the, the nylon we use on the SLS process. Um, the reason we wanted a stiffer material for this application is because it's used primarily for wind tunnel uh, work, and you want the wings to be quite stiff. And uh, <clears throat> so you can look at these uh, the material data sheet. Um, now, to one of the main things that this type of technology has been used for is uh, for display purposes and uh, for marketing, that sort of thing. And so here we have a NASA environmental responsible aircraft desktop model that we recently completed. This, uh, uh, this is an effort by the different aircraft companies. And you can see, you know, uh, kind of grow this overnight and then um, the model shop uh, preps it and paints it. And, um, but that's only like the older, I mean, application now. Uh, what's happened is these materials have become very mature. It used to be in the 90s when you had uh, a model that you're going to show at a meeting, if you stumbled and it fell on the floor, it would shatter in a million pieces. That doesn't happen any longer. Most of these, of these parts I can smash on the floor without them being broken. Um, and so the materials have become mature. The machines have become reliable. And that's why this silent industrial revolution is about to take place. I mean, even the kind of stuff we're planning to make in the next year for internal uh, parts uh, for aircraft, um, the kind of thing that we're projecting, there aren't even enough machines out in the world to handle the whole thing. And you've got Lockheed and Boeing and Raytheon, everybody doing the same thing. So uh, things are about to get very interesting. So uh, one example that I like to show here, and uh, you know, I couldn't find it here in my uh, part uh, in my boxes, uh, <clears throat> but um, what happened is that back around 2001, we ran into a problem. All aircraft, um, regardless of type, would develop stress cracks. And now in this case, a stress crack had developed in a very critical area of the main, main uh, bulkhead that holds the landing gear and the wing together. You can't take something like that out of the aircraft and put it on a machine and, you know, and grind out the the, the stress crack. No, how do you get in there? In this case, it was up, you know, you walk under the aircraft and the technician had to reach up with the mirror and look and he could see where the stress cracks were. Now, the, uh, there were, I think, 10 or 20 aircraft uh, down by the Navy that uh, they're eager to get moving again uh, back in the air. And um, and we were trying to figure out how do we fix this. Well, it turns out, first of all, we have all the um, surfaces of the aircraft in CAD. And so what we did is we grew the section that was the problem right here in CAD. Then um, one of our tool design guys uh, uh, grew this tool that fits and indexes right into place only one way. And you can see it has this, this opening. You see right in here, and then you use a router tool like a, a grinder, and um, uh, it's like a ball a grinder that grinds out the stress crack. So when you get it early and you, the stress crack is very shallow, and so instead of letting it propagate, when you grind it out, no more stress cracks, you fix the problem. So what happened is that um, they managed to, um, you know, like take this thing, put it up inside the aircraft in that place. It just locks in. Take the grinder, grind across that surface till there's nothing, you don't feel anything anymore, and the stress crack is gone. The amount of cost savings was unbelievable for this type of fix that happens so quickly. We were able to grow these parts uh, in like practically overnight, and, uh, and they're co co it's fairly complex. You can see the hole right there. That was a place where it, it uh, the air was blew out the chips, you know, into a bag, um, and uh, this was um, the, uh, 
we won the um, World Excellence Award first place for this um, idea. And um, then here's another picture of it. You can see this uh, other green color here. You see how it indexes on all the surfaces? So it only fits one way. Then the technicians uses this uh, deburring tool, moves it, slides it back and forth till the crack is gone. So that's one uh, that was a really a unique kind of application. Another one where we won the World Excellence Award third place, um, only because it wasn't as complex to make, um, uh, pretty standard. But I actually have the part here. Um, this is a, this is a uh, aircraft locator tool. 72 fastener locations, and we press fit the metal bushings in there, and then we could drill normal to the mold line uh, in, and have very precise uh, uh, locations. And so what happened, we had 92% reduction in cost, 40% savings in labor, 98% reduction in defects. So that gives you some idea. And uh, we call these... Uh, RMSTs or Rapid Manufactured Soft Tooling. <laughs> and uh, here are some of the cost benefits. We had identified over 1,300 of these, and they've been made uh, in the last few years. I've lost count how many. But um, implemented 488 part locators, uh, like 80% reduction in tooling implementation cost, 90% reduction in sustaining maintenance costs and process flow demonstrated. 500% improvement in installation accuracy. They used to measure with a scale and then with a pencil mark it, and that was it. And you didn't know whether you were normal to the mold line, really, you guessed. So 500% improvement in installation accuracy. All, uh, we, I believe we were the first to implement this. Now everybody uses it. Um, so um, what are some of the things we're doing in the future? Um, uh, by next year, we're going to have one of our new aircraft. I can't mention names, you know, because I had to go through document clearance and all that. Um, but um, just to give you an idea, the um, new kind of machine that's come out for the needs that we have in aircraft, uh, the EOSIN P800 from Germany, it's a high temperature type of uh, machine to handle high temp polymers or plastics. And <clears throat> So what we're trying to do is uh, we're also dealing with electrostatic dissipative type of effects. You, know, you don't want uh, internal plastic components to build up static electricity. You know? So uh, what's happening is we're going to start production on this sort of thing by next year. And um, now these machines right now are like 1.3 million. You know? The machines that we're using right now are around half a million that I showed earlier. Um, the 3D printers that are out there now, they've come down in cost because uh, they don't have quite the accuracy, but they've come down in cost to like $5,000. Let's talk about some 500 where they replicate themselves. They can grow their own parts, and that's routinely done. Like this uh, EOS, uh, they grow a lot of the internal components of this machine uh, with the previous machine. You know? So you have this idea of self-replication, which will happen more and more also on the nanoscale. <clears throat> so um, expensive uh, materials, another problem. All these costs are going to come down as we gear up to make this like a worldwide phenomenon. Um, uh, briefly, <clears throat> one of the uh, industries that's really switched over already is the hearing aid industry. Hearing aid shells are... Uh, uh, unique. Every uh, ear has a unique shape. And so what they've done is they can uh, mass produce custom implants, custom uh, shapes uh, on the SLS machine. And they uh, do like 500 of these overnight, each one uniquely shaped. So we've gone from mass production, which we're good at making millions of identical parts. Now with added manufacturing, we can make uh, uh, thousands of uh, uh, custom shaped parts. So, um, see one of the problems, traditional manufacturing methods are expensive, significant lead times, require tooling, incur high additional costs due to supplemental processes. So, the idea is to get beyond this. When you can make uh, 
Like here, this is, this is a tool, but imagine making the end product with all these holes already in it, then why do you need the tool? So, and then like the T38, we just celebrated 50th anniversary of our T38 trainer. Uh, that means you've had to sustain tooling, maintain tooling for over uh, 50 years. Imagine the cost of that tooling. So um, once we get further in this technology, it'll be the end of tooling. So um, we also need a new design paradigm for engineers to know that we can make these multifunctional type of uh, things like internal uh, structures, uh, um, internal non-structural parts. Here's an example. It's actually a, uh, my friend John Wooten from CalRAM. He has a service bureau, and they make uh, nylon parts. They make metal parts. And like this, was, this came out of the machine like this, fully functional. What, they, what you do is in CAD, you design it like this, but you make sure that like for this, these uh, links don't touch each other. They're grown like this. I don't know if you can see that. And same here. And this thing, how it rotates, has to be equidistant. Otherwise, the laser will fuse it, and then it won't move. But so the point is, you, you grab this out of the machine, and you can immediately uh, you know, close it off and unscrew it. Uh, you can have snap fit type of parts that snap together. You can have complex internal structures. So you can make a single piece that would normally take uh, several different processes and bonding and all kinds of effort. So huge cost savings, and plus you grow these overnight. Now this is just a, uh, my friend called the, the MOAD, mother of all ducts, because it <laughs> shows all these different capabilities. <clears throat> So um, now I already uh, mentioned about going from mass production to mass customization. Um, one of the other things, the world's first printed plane uh, just recently came out last summer. Um, and um, that was an unmanned aerial vehicle, a UAV, that was about like five foot wingspan um, that they grew, you know, kind of thing where you can grow these things almost overnight. Eventually, you'll be able to grow it as a whole unit. And um, that's the idea of um, now to, to prepare for that. Um, Optimec in New Mexico is one of the companies that does this additive manufacturing. And what they did is <clears throat> they um, use metal powders out of different tubes going into a nozzle uh, onto a substrate and then a, a laser melts that layer by layer and builds it up. And what's exciting is because they can do multiple powders and control the amount of uh, the different powders, how they mix. So what they did is they created uh, some time ago the first uh, gradient uh, part which transitions between three different types of uh, titanium alloys. So uh, that's something impossible in our regular world. Now, now we're able to do gradient uh, uh, type of production. And imagine if you had an um, engine block that's 100% stainless steel on the inside and transitions gradually to 100% copper on the outside to dissipate the heat fast. Um, you wouldn't have the problem with the CTE, the coefficient of thermal expansion between two materials that uh, heat up and cool down and then start to separate. Um, there's a lot more to be said on this. I could go on, but um, it's important that now we can do gradient, uh, grow gradient parts that was never possible before. Uh, for our spacecraft, you might want different types of uh, um, materials that transition for, uh, for, for heat or dissipation, that sort of thing. Um, anyway. What will happen eventually, and this is what I'm coming towards, and I should also mention Optimec also uh, has uh, another part of its company that uh, grows layer by layer integrated circuits. So the idea is once you, in the future, like in 20, 30 years, you have a hybrid machine that can grow all the integrated circuits, all the aircraft, all the complex assemblies, all as one from the ground up. And you see that right here. Um, that's me. I'd probably be with a cane, you know, at, by that time. And 
So you can see the aircraft right there. And um, the machine is growing the aircraft from the ground up, fully functional. You add uh, aircraft fuel and you're done. Um, and now what's important is there's no assembly line, there's no more tooling, and it's not an aircraft factory because uh, the, the next file coming down the line into that machine could be for Ferrari or for a video camera, whatever you need. So you can imagine uh, this type of uh, application for space. Um, uh, at the Marshall Space Flight Standard, NASA already, they have uh, uh, all these types of machines that they're experimenting with because uh, when you get this on the moon or on Mars or International Space Station, if something goes wrong and you need uh, uh, a broken part shipped from Earth, it, they could be dead by the time it gets there. But no, if you have these machines with you, you can use the regolith uh, you know, uh, material on the moon or on, on Mars and, uh, and make your own whatever you need, you know, or near-Earth asteroids, hollow those out and use that, you know. So um, space applications are really critical in this type of additive manufacturing technology. Uh, now if we come to this point, we have to realize in the future, a lot of this stuff is going to get leapfrogged by nanotechnology. So let's look at that side now. <clears throat> um, nano uh, really deals with materials and systems between 1 and 100 nanometers. And um, another way to look at it, if you take uh, 10 hydrogen atoms uh, shoulder to shoulder, that gives you one nanometer. And it's also, physicists know it as 10 angstroms. You know, um, a DNA molecule is about two and a half nanometers wide. So uh, life gets pretty down there, you know, it's pretty amazing. So i uh, give you a different feeling for it. Um, here, like the smallest ant actually uh, would be two million nanometers in size you know, when you look at nanoscale. And <clears throat> here, th this chart mentioned the mesoscale, but we're really interested in the nanoscale here, one to 100 nanometers. Um, what's important to realize is people say, well, what's so unique about nano? Why can't we just do the same things we do at the normal scale, at the nano? Well, the problem is that um, just below one nanometer, you're in the uh, at top, you know, individual atoms range. And when you go above 100 nanometers, you're in the classical physics range. So one, you're in, uh, down below, you're in quantum mechanics. Uh, everything obeys quantum physics. Whereas you get up higher, it obeys uh, classical mechanics. And the problem is uh, nanoscale, it overlaps the two of them. So you have to come up with totally different approaches uh, to making things. So what does that mean? Uh, just uh, can't go into too much detail, but imagine this. I saw this in one book, thought it was very um, uh, illustrative. Um, here's a letter F. <clears throat> that letter F is, consists of 1,660 aluminum atoms. Okay, So you say, well, that looks pretty nice, but uh, can't we make it a little smoother for manufacturing? Well, no, because those are individual atoms. You can't use a cutter at that level. You know That's why additive manufacturing is used at the nanoscale, and also automated assembly with DNA, that sort of thing. You can't use cutters and like the usual subtractive process that we're used to at the normal scale. But now let's look a little further. Um, <clears throat> that's this letter F is never going to happen in the real nano world. Uh, what you're going to see is this is going. This is this would be what you would see at zero Kelvin, absolute zero. That's minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and uh, now let's bring it up to 300 Kelvin, which is like room temperature. That doesn't look so good. That letter F. The reason is that now the uh, Brownian motion is jiggling all over the place, and so if you're going to make things uh, in the nano world, like mechanical type of uh, 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 things, uh, machinery and that sort of thing, you have to take this into consideration, this constant jiggling. So let's look at it here. Um, here's an example uh, from NanoRex. Uh, 
and my colleagues uh, who used to be on our nano manufacturing tech group as well, very active. Uh, he <coughs> uh, started this company uh, and he created the first CAD system for nano design called Nano Engineer One, which is actually free to download. And um, this example here, um, what you're seeing, the yellow, uh, these are individual atoms here. The yellow atoms are sulfur atoms. And problem at that level is a stickiness of atoms. Uh, so how do you make a motor? Well, here, by having the same type of atoms, uh, they repel. And so you can get them to, to, to move like that. Um, now, uh, you're seeing the Brownian motion at room temperature. Now, uh, when you look at the actual CAD system, uh, some of you who use CAD, this kind of looks a little bit familiar, you know, even though it's different. Like when you open this up, you actually have the periodic table with the elements, and you like double click on a carbon atom, and boom, like here's an aluminum atom that's got like the three bonds. Uh, then when you bring it in here, it automatically hooks properly to the other atoms that uh, match it. And once you have your assembly made, what you wanted to create, then you can simulate it at room temperature and uh, do other kind of simulations. So this is uh, pretty powerful stuff. Uh, they also integrated um, some work with uh, automated DNA assembly into the CAT system. <coughs> um, I can't get into this, but I'm leaving this chart up. Some of these charts I'm leaving for your reference and anyone who's interested. But it's important to understand um, the, it's Griffiths back in 1920. He wanted to know the, uh, why the uh, theoretical strength of, say, of glass fibers was 2 million PSI, but in the real world, you're only getting 25,000 PSI. Why the big discrepancy? Well, it turns out at normal scale, we're dealing with surface uh, uh, scratches, uh, surface inconsistencies that make the parts very weak. But when you get down to the atomic level, you're actually dealing with the atomic bond strength itself. That's where you get the 2 million PSI. And that's why when we make things at the nano scale, these things are incredibly strong unbelievably strong. And if I go uh, back here, look at this, um, imagine you think, oh, you know, these things are rubbing against each other, you know, so like maybe you have to replace these gears after, you know, 20 years or five years. No, these are atoms. Atoms do not deteriorate. This, these things can go on like this for, for thousands of years, you know. Um, now, the uh, actual shape here, if you put too much energy into the system, you can disrupt it. But if you leave it, there is no, uh, <clears throat> no fatigue. You know, atomic bonds just stay the way they are. And so you have no more tolerance and QA issues that we're so used to here at Northrop. <clears throat> at the atomic scale, all matter is digital. And any atom of the same element is exactly the same size. You don't have to worry, oh, that one doesn't quite fit. We've got to use another one. No, they're all the same. And as I mentioned, they don't wear out. Atomic bonds don't fatigue. So you have this digital perfection, which is totally alien to the way we think at the normal scale. Um, the, one of the secrets of nanotechnology are the microscopes. The new kind of uh, work in microscopy has been amazing. The old electron microscopes that can show atoms uh, were passive. The new ones, like atomic force microscope or AFMs, are active. They actually place parts, uh, uh, atoms in positions and that sort of thing. So um, now look at dip pen nanolithography from Nano Inc. Uh, Nano Inc. spoke, uh, one of their people spoke at one of our nano manufacturing. Uh, monthly webinars and uh, uh, fascinating uh, thing because uh, this ink uh, pen of the atomic force microscope uh, can lay down atoms individually or DNA or whatever you need to, uh, depositing them directly. And now the tip is actually 15 nanometers in width. Now that's the world's smallest pen, 15 nanometers. and. Uh, What's neat is they actually have um, uh, 55,000 of these pen in array with multiple materials. And what they've done now uh, at Nano Inc., they're actually um, uh, addressing pharmaceutical counterfeiting. 
in, in some of the third world countries, uh, ph pharmaceutical counterfeiting is up to 50%. In the U.S., it's 1%. But what's interesting here is that they're able to mark um, with an atomic force microscope, they can put the code of uh, where this pill or um, uh, capsule was made onto the capsule at the rate of one million per hour. Can you imagine one million per hour, and so now the uh, the counterfeiters, you know, what can they do? They'd have to spend millions buying atomic force microscopes to, you know, do the same thing. And the whole reason they're counterfeiting is they want to make a quick buck. Well, here, you know, you, you need a mic atomic force microscope to see, you know, and you'll see, aha, this is where this capsule came from. So remarkable. So, and that's um, actually using uh, additive layer, you know, so we're doing the same thing at that level. And I think a lot of the people working in this field in nano aren't fully aware of the capability of these complex assemblies that you can do at the nano scale because you are using additive layer manufacturing. So um, just to give you some other data, this is more at the micro level. Here's the world's smallest uh, gasoline engine. It's done in England. That's why I call it petrol. You know. Runs for two years on a single squirt of lighter fuel produces 700 times more energy than a conventional battery. They're able to get around the overheating at that small scale. And um, so this is going to be, like in the next five years, you'll hear more about this. Um, the other things, like the power shirt, uh, fiber-based nanotechnology and clothing, where you can have two different type of uh, surfaces that rub against each other. So while you're walking along, you're generating electricity and you know, power up your iPhone or whatever, your cell phone, you know. And um, they, they also have like, you know, when you think about walking, you know, that's 150 pounds every step on your heel. You're using piezoelectricity there to generate uh, electricity from that and to power uh, your devices or to heat up your, your clothes in the cold or whatever. So all these things are, are coming. Um, but what's even more important, the reason I've kind of brought those things in, here's another step much deeper. And that is uh, at the Joseph Fourier University, they uh, implanted the first functional glucose biofuel cell in a living animal, eliminating the need to surgically remove and replace a power generating device for implants. So you don't need to put, um, uh, you know, you have to replace batteries, you know, and uh, and remove it from the body, that sort of thing. It, and the other thing is in science fiction, you know, they talk about cyborgs in the future, half human, half machine. No, because we're using biomimetics. We're using what nature has given and, uh, and actually generating the electricity inside the human body and uh, using the glucose, you know. And uh, so cyborgs are a thing of the past, you know. And, uh, very interesting. Now, um, also the first uh, nanotech synthetic organ plant transplant was recently done where, um, you know, we grew, um, literally grew this first synthetic organ, a trachea windpipe, and um, it's a nanocomposite to form a scaffold exactly the same size and shape as the patient's own windpipe, which is then seeded with the stem cells from the patient's own bone marrow. So, uh, no more organ donors. And the thing is, soon, you know, they were saying by 2015, we can replace any organ in the body that way, except for the nervous system and the brain. That might take another year or two. You know? <laughs> so, um, now the other thing I, I was really excited to share with you is uh, the world's smallest radio. Um, this is like a true nanotechnology because um, Alex Settle, um, uh, physicist invented, uh, he found out that a single carbon nanotube uh, can be used to uh, broadcast a signal, amplify it, and convert it to an external speaker. And uh, so you're actually, you know, a single carbon nanotube, which is like uh, a few nanometers in width, uh, can, now that can be in, placed in the body, it can be used in, inside of uh, individual um, Foglets. I'm going to talk about programmable matter later. You can use it anywhere and and uh, uh, inside the bloodstream. Uh, but 
the exciting thing is, um, you know, in the old days we had vacuum tubes, then we go to the transistor radio, then the wireless sensors, and then finally now we're at the rate of a, a carbon na single carbon nanotube to have all the uh, four aspects of a, of a radio. And uh, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of exciting here. Uh, what's happening is uh, you have the end of the the uh, nanotube is vibrating to the frequency of the radio signal and thereby generating that sound uh, for the speaker. And uh, now when they did this the first time, they, they happened to uh, bring in uh, Layla by Eric Clapton. And so you're going to hear the very first experience of this right now. Here. <laughs> that uh, you have all that static is because it's not in a vacuum. So guess what? We might be going back to vacuum tubes. You know? <laughs> but here at the nano level rather than you know, the big old bulky uh, uh, vacuum tubes. But also, you know, in a, even a perfect radio um, or a TV signal, you're still going to get a very, very slight static at the very, you know, if you listen very carefully. And that's actually from the cosmic uh, Big Bang uh, background radiation. No, which is pretty amazing. So, so you can always hear the Big Bang still going on. You know, if you're very good. And my wife has very good hearing. You know, she, you know. But anyway, um, what's coming in the future? Um, these are some of the things that kind of blow my mind, and these are the kind of things that are definitely on the way. Um, I've, uh, some of the people that I work with, with, uh, with um, the nano manufacturing tech group, and some of them are, you know, active in some of these things, and uh, and I know some of the people. Um, respirocytes. Uh, this is a, an amazing thing. Imagine replacing your blood corpuscles uh, with synthetic corpuscles, which we call respirocytes. They uh, hold 234 times the amount of oxygen or CO2 from a normal blood cell. And what does that mean? It means that, uh, say you have a heart attack, your heart stops, and um, no problem. Uh, you've got four hours before you need to breathe. And, you know, some people had written, and I've given some of these talks back east and things, and these, uh, people ask, well, you know, you're still going to have to breathe. I said, no, you don't, because the medulla oblongata in the back here monitors your breath in real time with every breath and tells and, and, and adjusts the rate of breathing. If you have enough oxygen, there is no need to breathe. And so here, you can go for four hours. So say your heart has stopped, you've got a heart attack, and just call the hospital, tell them, look, you know, I'm kind of nervous about this. I'm going to go, uh, go to the bar, have a drink first, and I just have everything ready when I get over there. I may do some shopping, you know, feel better, you know, go to Nordstrom, buy a new jacket or something, you know. So, but the other exciting thing about this is that um, for divers and astronauts, too, um, for divers, uh, you can go, uh, you don't need a scuba tank anymore. You just go down, you know, with some weights and explore the bo ocean bottom, and you have four hours. But the other thing is that you can have your respirocytes programmed to handle the nitrogen, and it actually does it instantly, so there is no adjustment. So you, don't, you can go way down in the ocean, come right back up, no, no, no waiting. You know? um, um, the desktop factory, uh, I would recommend looking at uh, the nanorex.com. Uh, I don't have time to... On, in this talk to get into it, but it's very fascinating. That kind of takes the place of the, uh, the, the factor of the future that I showed you earlier, and where you can actually, uh, um, uh, Eric Drexler, the uh, founder of nanotechnology, wrote the book, uh, um, Inched of Creation, back in 1986. Uh, he's actually chief scientist at NanoRex, and they put together this remarkable video that shows how the nanofactory would actually work. And it kind of makes you a believer when you watch it. Um, the other thing that's definitely on the way is programmable matter from uh, foglets to atoms. And um, programmable matter um, is like imagine a television screen 
uh, with all the pixels. It looks like a regular screen. You don't see the pixels. But now imagine if you had volumetric pixels that are um, uh, uh, like actual volume. Uh, they're shaped like this in this picture here. And they hold on to each other. They, they have like a bond strength that's programmed so that they can take certain shapes. They can, uh, they can be real hard, so it can feel like a hardwood floor on the floor when you have quadrillions of them all over your floor. Your whole house is made of this, let's say. And uh, so what happens is that you're sleeping in your foglet house, okay? And your, your mattress, your bed, uh, your sheets are all made of foglets having different consistencies, different color, you know, and, and your pajamas are made of foglets, okay? So you wake up in the morning, you can just encode into your house computer, okay, I want my daytime uh, favorite uh, uh, furniture arrangement, you know, that like whatever you get off the internet that you like can be different every day. Uh, and so suddenly your, your pajamas reform into, uh, into a, a, a Sunday suit or whatever you want. The bed, uh, the um, foglets reform themselves into a couch uh, and table and chairs. And then, now let's say a friend, I'm originally from Berlin, so a friend from Berlin calls me and I said, well, I have a choice. I can either talk, uh, I'll go into his room or he can come into my room. So let's say I want to be in his room. So suddenly all the foglets in the room reconfigure exactly to what his room looks like. And then his, he will form in front of me out of foglets. I can shake his hand. His hand will feel warm, uh, feel real. Um, and, and the thing is, this is not virtual reality. I'm not wearing 3D glasses because the couch is real. I can sit on it. So pretty soon you don't know what's real, what's not real. And uh, so you can imagine, um, if you say, oh, I think I'm going to go to my computer, play World of Warcraft. No, you don't want to do that. You just reconfigure your house into World of Warcraft, and you can actually be fighting your monsters and doing all your stuff as if it were real. Um, <clears throat> I hope they have a good safety you know, <laughs> in installed in that. Uh, but anyway, now think in the future, if everybody has these things made, uh, and eventually we'll do this out of uh, control atoms that way to make everything, but, but even with the, these uh, uh, volumetric pixels or foglets, um, if you have them everywhere and using them, um, let's say a, a burglar wants to bur burglarize your house, break in and steal things, what would he steal if everything all your things that you have uh, made of foglets, what value does it have? What he would be interested in is the program that makes those foglets into those shapes. So, you know, your society would completely change. And what's interesting is Intel is already working on this, and before them, I believe, uh, DARPA already has uh, um, uh, put money into this. They're actively working on some types of programmable matter already. So this is on its way, but obviously it's going to take a while because um, you can imagine one of the big hurdles is the amount of uh, <clears throat> um, uh, computer power to, to control all these uh, little foglets. You know? So that's still a, uh, some, a hurdle, big hurdle that has to be handled in time. But um, <clears throat> as I say, this is kind of thing is coming. So. Um, where do we go from there? Uh, uh, from nanotech, well, we could go to femto technology, which would be, you know, nanotech is 10 to the minus 9th, femto is 10 to the minus 15th. That's the nucleus of the atom, that size. And so some of the atomic uh, uh, power that we're using, we're already using a little bit of uh, femto technology. Also, we have these femtosecond lasers, 10 to the minus 15th seconds. Uh, these lasers can actually show the uh, uh, formation of atomic bonds in real time. So there, there's a little bit of this coming already. <clears throat> so, but what's really coming in the future? Uh, so uh, can we really guess? And I wanted to kind of say just a couple of things here, kind of coming towards the end. Uh, Jules Verne uh, was incredibly uh, 
correct in predicting the future. In, the vo in his voyage to the moon, he had the correct size of the space capsule, the launch site in Florida, the length of the voyage, the number of astronauts, weightlessness in space, and the splashdown in the ocean. That's incredible. You know? But then what's even more interesting, I'm sure none of you have heard this, he wrote a book called Paris in the 20th Century, back in 1863 during the uh, Civil War, <laughs> you know, um, and <clears throat> that book was locked away and his great-grandson found it in 1994, 130 years later, and what he describes about Paris in the 20th century, he talks about uh, glass skyscrapers, air conditioning, TV, elevators, high-speed trains, gas-powered cars, fax machines, internet-like systems, amazing. So that book is available. You can buy it on, you know, on Amazon. Um, and uh, Michu Kaku, in his book, Physics of the Future, talks a little about that, a very good book. Um, uh, one of the things is, um, how about, you know, here's someone who's incredibly prescient, but what about people who don't you know, get it right? You know? The Lensman series by Doc Smith, one of my favorite uh, science fiction novels back from the 1950s, he talks about, uh, a guy in the future, he's, uh, his warp drive breaks down, he's stuck out in between star systems, and uh, so he's fixing his warp drive, and when he gets it fixed, um, he gets his slipstick, his uh, slide wheel out to calculate his next jump in, into hyperspace, and this is within, where ten, within 10 years, um, no one would ever use a, a slide wheel again. You know, it would be computers and calculators. So he completely missed the computer revolution. So what are we missing? What are we not seeing? That's just around the corner, maybe. You know, I mean, th that's mind-boggling. Um, now, um, just to kind of finish up, um, uh, this one uh, Russian f astrophysicist, Nikolai Kardashev, he thought, well, what's the future going to be like? Do we have a little bit of a road map? And he came up with a you know, as a physicist, uh, civilization would be based on energy consumption. And so um, he says there are types 1 to 3, and we're about at type 0.7. We're not quite there yet. Um, uh, in pre industrial society, we used one-fifth of a horsepower. Of course, a horse uses one horsepower, you know. Um, industrial revolution started to use hundreds of horsepower, but a type 1 civilization is global and planetary, and uses the power of the sun, uh, 10 to the 17 watts. The entire planet's energy becomes available, like you see in Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, those type of societies. Now type two will be stellar, consuming all the power of the sun, 10 to the 27 watts. That's like Star Trek's United Federation of Planets before warp drive. And finally, type three is galactic, billions of stars, 10 to the 37 watts, like the Star Wars Empire or the Star Trek's Borg. And then also possible, and Nicho Kaku talks about that, uh, a type four extragalactic sources of energy like dark matter, uh, like the godlike Q of Star Trek, whose power is extragalactic. So that gives you a little overview of, you know, coming from, you know, additive manufacturing, where it's taking us, then going to the nanoscale, and then seeing what the implications are and where are we going in technology. There are so many different ways of looking at it. Um, Ray Kurzweil, uh, he's one of the uh, amazing people that gives us uh, some visions of this. But um, anyway, um, I've kind of given you one, one version and uh, something to think about. And uh, now I do want to quickly add, uh, I wonder, uh, these parts, is this something an artist created? Well, in reality, these are mathematical equations. And, and I think it's remarkable that, you know, when you were in school, you probably had to plot uh, things on a graph. Well, if you um, um, plot, you're usually in x, y, but if you plot x, y, z, some of these complex equations, and you, they be, they're not, it, you um, uh, um, have it from like uh, minus five to plus five or something, you know, then uh, the continuous uh, surfaces that uh, develop from that, and you thicken that, and you grow it on the, 
on our machine, then you get something like this, incredible uh, kind of detail and uh, complexity. And so these are mathematical equations put into uh, the real world, kind of. So very, very interesting. And um, now um, the, tech, the, the conference that handles all this with SME, uh, like internationally, with people from all over the world coming to RAPID uh, every year. And this one is May 22nd uh, in Atlanta. So just want to make you aware of that because this is an SME-sponsored uh, event. Um, here are some of the contacts. Um, the, um, the, all the tech groups right now are being reconfigured in SME, so you may have to wait for the uh, upper one, uh, sme.org slash nano. Probably in a few weeks it will be uh, online again. The RTAM, sme.org, RTAM, Rapid Technology Atom Manufacturing, you can access that. Um, and then that's my uh, address there. Um, I'll let you look at this for a minute. Uh, uh, that finishes my presentation, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Yes. Uh, yes. For us, uh, currently we can use SLS to pad uh, the nylon. Mm -hmm. We can also uh, clean the system, purge the nylon out, and fabricate uh, build out of metals. Yes. Uh -huh. What type of metals? Well, um, there are several available, but um, we use uh, um, a tool steel. Um, and then we impregnate it with, uh, with bronze. And so this is a little bit of an older technology, and nowadays we really recommend people, if they want metal parts, to uh, uh, go outside. I'd like to have a metal part in-house. Uh, uh, they've become uh, very, uh, very good. Uh, make end, uh, th they make the actual you know, metallic parts. There's no extra furnace cycle or anything like that. So, um, <clears throat> but we do have a number of different types of uh, materials available. Um, like, here's one that I like to show. It's an elastomeric part, a rubber-like part. You can see that. Um, you can come up here and look at some of these. Um, we do have a Stratasys Titan in Rancho Bernardo and uh, they can make this type of material, a PPSF, polyphenol slow foam. <coughs> uh, we have uh, also, I can, Maryland, our facility there has uh, several rapid prototyping machines, and then there's another SLS machine in uh, Bethpage. So, um, but anyway, I think, uh, uh, I think that answers your question. Yes. Any others? Okay. Thank you very much, Boris. Uh -huh. We appreciate it. Thank you, folks online. We'll see you next time.